Well, having thoroughly blown that defective power supply to smithereens, although quite a lot of the components did survive, um, I've decided to take another one to bits because I'm not going to be using these because I did take one of the transformer windings off and it just wasn't up to scratch. It really wasn't uh, It wasn't uh, good isolation as is the case with so many of these cheap power supplies. So I'm going to open this one and uh, take the circuit board out, salvage the connector again because I'll be using the connector to connect to the... Uh, meteor lights uh, for alternative control systems and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a photo of the bottom of this circuit board then I'm going to uh, load it into Earthen View and flip it over um, and then just uh, note the component values off this side probably remove the transformer and uh, I've already done it with the other one and pulled all the windings off but um, I think I might actually do that again and just see what direction the windings are going because there's something quite weird uh, that I've not quite figured out yet, and it's the feedback circuit. So um, I'm just going to do that right now, and I'll be back shortly. OK, well, that's me pretty much reverse engineered now. Here's the uh, image I, I took a photo of the back, and then I uh, enhanced it, just basically made a silhouette of the outline, and then did the components. So um, this is the circuit, and let's divide it into its sections. Let's start with the power supply. The power supply is the diode coming in from the mains, uh, just ignore live and neutral really, it's just AC because uh, this is non-polarised, this connector can go in either way around. And then it charges that dubious 400 volt 2.2 microfarad capacitor, you know, the one that made the hissing noise and all the smoke came out of? Yeah, that one. Uh, the output uh, is easy to sort of keep separate, that's, uh, so just to, just to, uh, that's the diode and the input there, and that's the smoothing capacitor. There is also kind of a fuse, if that little zigzaggy. Now, I would uh, I would rip into it and say what a load of shit that is. But in, to be fair, um, it turns out this <laughs> the zigzaggy bit does disappear. Quite a lot else disappears as well, but the zigzaggy bit does definitely disappear. So, um, yeah, that kind of fuse kind of works. The output side of it is this little diode here and this capacitor and it's uh, the output is the secondary winding on the other side of the transformer. So it goes through this tiny diode, a 1N4148, not a 1N48, which I think I said last time. A 1N4148, I think it is. It's a very generic, tiny little diode that isn't really rated terribly high, they should have really used something like that. A 1N4 uh, or a high speed 1N4001 or something would have been a better choice there. There's a 220 microfarad smoothing capacitor and then there's a 1K resistor and LED just as sort of out, output indicator and also that serves as a hole for the smoke to come out of apparently. And the voltage out is some indeterminate 5 volt-ish type of thing. Okay, so moving on to this transistor. Um, the the transistors here, it's a very typical transistor. I've completely forgotten the number of it. Uh, where's my notes? Where's my notes? Where's my little cheat sheet? It's a 13001. Yes, that is a very common transistor. You find these applications. It's a sort of, it's a typical generic high voltage transistor. Quite surprising that you know what it can do. Um, given such things used to go bang and emit lots of smoke and in the old days they've come on leaps and bounds and now other components uh, go bang and emit smoke instead. But anyway, here's the transistor, here's the primary winding and there's the feedback winding. So if we get rid of this little bit of circuitry over here, we can see that initially when you turn the power on, this transistor is partially turned on by this 2.2 mega ohm resistor. It just trickles a bit of current in. And as soon as current flows in the primary, it induces current in the feedback winding, which uh, then um, goes through this 330 ohm resistor, this one nanofarad capacitor to the base, and drives it on. And that, uh, basically, it, it, it will drive it on until the uh, in inductor, the actual transformer, the core, is saturated with the magnetic field, and it can't uh, take any more magnetic field. And then the current will stop being coupled across and then it will sort of collapse and it will go into reverse and it will kind of discharge and turn itself off again. But here is the weird bit again. The feedback winding, the negative pulse of it, um, charges this capacitor 
negative with respect to the sort of circuit ground. Uh, let's say this is the circuit zero volt or negative, whatever you want to call it. It charges it negative with respect, respect to that. Um, and there's a sort of uh, timing factor as well. There's a, a resistor across that to trickle discharge that capacitor. And this means that uh, the negative transits in the feedback winding, when they've exceeded a certain amount, then to drive that transistor on, the output from the feedback winding has to exceed um, 7 volts above whatever that is, because there's this zener here with a very precise 7 volts. Um, I actually got the blittered circuit board and uh, lifted one leg of the Zeno and stuck the power supply and turned it up until it started to draw current. And it was a very precise 7 volts, like literally 6.9, no current, 7 volts, lots of current. So, yeah, as soon as this drops about, oh, 7.6 volts or so below uh, the negative rail here, it stops this being turned on. and. That's the bit I'm struggling to work out why. The only thing I can think of, I'm not even 100% sure, because uh, theoretically, oh, yeah, I, I'm a digital boy here. Um, this analog switch mode power supply stuff, it, everything's happening at once and it's quite complex. Um, I'm reckoning that uh, there's a possibility, and I might be wrong, that could this actual winding be wound in reverse to the others so that it only charges that capacitor as it, this one's, when this transistor turns off and the field collapses, it might put a pulse into that capacitor? I'm not 100% sure. Because then, if the capacitor was below the voltage, oh, it, it's tricky. Uh, I really am struggling to get my head around this little feedback circuit. It's impressive of its simplicity, but the only thing I can think of is that if it was the negative um, pulse, that, that as, you know, after this uh, winding had turned off, after the just had turned off, the collapsing field then charged that capacitor, which doesn't in a way sort of make sense, then if the capacitor was fully charged up to the voltage that was desired, then the negative transient in the feedback, the collapsing transient in the feedback, which is obviously what's charging this capacitor, would then be higher and would charge that capacitor up, but it would kind of like increase the voltage until that turned, that zener started clamping down, you know, stopping the circuit running. It's complex. The only way I can think of uh, working this out is to actually, and I have already taken one of these transformers to bits, is to take another one to bits. So, um, and actually this time, maybe even take a note of the direction the windings are wound. This is where I just get completely lost. Um, because uh, trying to track things happening in real time is just like, ugh. Especially when lots of things are happening at once. So uh, taking the tape off that holds these two halves of the core together, Gently rise that up. Oh, I've broken it, not to worry. It was glued together. Do you know, another odd thing is that uh, with these uh, systems, with these cores, oh God, this one really is messy. It's not coming apart as well as the other one. There's a bit of tape put between the two sections and that's to avoid them touching because that uh, changes the characteristic of the transformer. It makes it sort of lossy. So, let's see if I can actually keep track as I, as I unwind this transformer of not just the number of turns, but the direction of the turns. So let's, uh, we'll also check it for safety and isolation, which is a given conclusion that it's not going to be that safe. So I'm going to be going... I'm going to base a reference. I, I, I'm not sure how... Uh, normally, transformer, uh, when they're drawn, they put dots in the transformer to show the direction it's going. So um, I'm going to have to uh, bring this back in again. Uh, so here's the transformer here. So there's one point. 
that's the secondary. So uh, the feedback winding uh, is the first thing that's actually connected, and it's actually rather unsurprisingly, it really is. It's just uh, it's this winding here which does correlate with the schematic. And if I'm going clockwise, then this one, this pin here, appears to be the one that's going clockwise. Okay. This is all going to get slightly abstract because uh, I can't say I've ever actually... Oh, blame me. Listen to all the phones going off. I've got more than one phone here at the moment. I'm testing another phone. I've got a little backup phone and it's... Uh, they're both Android now. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Ooh, unlucky for some. So that's uh, thirteen turns on the feedback winding. And the clockwise one uh, is reference to... There, so I'll put a dot there, which indicates that that's the clockwise uh, winding. Let's take a look at the next winding. This is the secondary winding, most likely. A couple of thin layers of token gesture tape here, just to make it look like they're trying to keep them isolated. and tape that just won't come off, actually. So, a fairly heavy winding, which you'd expect in the secondary. And... it's... clockwise one is... this one. And I will say, it's trying to keep clear of the... If I hold this up, it's trying to keep clear there of the uh, primary windings, the high voltage windings, but there is still just a layer of this thin tape between them, which is just squirmy. As time goes on, I'll just accept this is absolutely normal and think it's completely fine. So here we go. One... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven turns. So, um, that was the secondary, and it's, um, eleven turns. Um, and it's Clockwise turn is reference to negative, so that's that winding. Bear with me here. And now for this, uh, oh, actually, you know what? There's an extra winding that I've actually snapped one. So let's uh, let's correct that to, um, that was 12 turns. So the, wind, the primary and secondary uh, sure, sorry, the secondary and the feedback roughly have the same number of turnings, approximately, give or take one turn. Okay, so when you can see through this thin layer of tape, you can see the sec the primary winding, which is the mains voltage. Uh, it just doesn't instill much confidence in the isolation. Couple of turns of tape. I suppose, technically speaking, that, you know, oh, I'd rather just have, you know, a much thicker insulation between, uh, you know, the mains and me. Oh, this tape's getting everywhere. It's sticking to my fingers. Okay, so this is going to be the... This is going to be this winding here, the, these pins here. And I have to work out which is going clockwise. 
I think, because there's a bit of tape jam there, I'm pretty sure that that one is the one that's going clockwise, which would relate to positive. So if that's pulling down to negative, the dot is positive. Let me. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to get my head round this. As I say, I'm not uh, totally into the Transformers normally in, in this detail. It's all a bit of an educational experience for me and uh, you guys because you can share this educational experience. I want to actually make sure I get this the right way round because uh, this is crucial that the direction the windings are wound uh, determines which way, uh, you know, which polarity of voltage will be induced in one uh, in relation to another. It's all very educational. And it's not helpful that this is just not coming out. Yeah, that is definitely the positive one. And I already know from the one I took apart that this was uh, 170 turns, so I'm not going to unwind that. That would be just shitloads of turns. That would take ages. So let's just uh, abbreviate that. 170 turns. Uh, okay, let me let me see if I can get my head around this now. So, when the transformer, the transistor turns on, the dot is positive and the non-dot pulled down negative. Um, so that this would be end up positive and this would end up negative, which would not go through that. So is it actually when the transistor turns off that the collapsing field then charges a capacitor and because this is because the dot's positive, and the non-dot's negative when this transistor turns on, that means the dot here is positive. So as the transistor turns on, it's getting its feedback through, the, through this resistor, through that capacitor to turn it on. And then as when, once that's turned off and it's collapsing, then this end goes negative, that end goes positive, charges that capacitor. And if current is flowing into the capacitor, if the capacitor's maybe down, say, about 4 volts, so current is flowing into it, um, then you'll also get the negative current on the feedback winding going through this diode and charging this capacitor. Oh no, uh, if it's uh, fully charged, if it's reached the voltage level, then the matching current, said Clive, spitting rather forcibly on the drawing, uh, yeah, that means that the voltage in this capacitor will effectively give or take, yeah, the diode will compensate. The voltage in this capacitor will mimic the voltage in this one. That's weird. And then you've got the, the forward, uh, you've got the 0.6 volt to um, drop across that, which accounts for the roughly 7 volts. Uh, it would actually be like, uh, I reckon that would be about 5.6. I'm sorry if this is all gibberish. This is just me suddenly making realisation of how this all works. And it's quite complex and it's very, very clever. So yeah, the voltage in this capacitor here will mimic the voltage in that capacitor there because of the similarity in the feedback windings. And when the voltage in that capacitor is high enough, the voltage in this capacitor is so high that to the uh, feedback winding has to overcome the uh, Zener diode plus the voltage in that. So that would actually hold it almost down at ground level and stop this oscillating. So as soon as that actually gets charged up to the desired output voltage, then this uh, oscillator circuit actually effectively gets shut down. That is very clever. It's probably absolute gibberish, 
if you're not actually following this, but some others that, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got some experience, if you know uh, how these transformers work, that will make sense. Uh, to others, it'll be an incredibly boring video, and you'll just be saying, oh, blow another one up. But uh, yeah, that, that suddenly all makes sense now. And also, that means that when this transformer's on, it's not having to worry about a dead short across the output here, because it, it's not going to see that. Um, it's only the collapsing field that actually is going to see that. Um, this this is clever. This is this is very clever. Yeah, yeah. That that's quite neat. That's a bit of a revelation. I've just learned something tonight. Hmm.